Uh, as a reminder, uh, I've said this before, but so although unable to hold our physical events, we thought it was really important that the club should uh, continue to perform its unique role of drawing together a cross section of Cardiff and wider Welsh life to listen to prominent speakers talk about the issues of today and tonight's a good example uh, of that. Um, and as I've said, we've received considerable support over recent months and in particular from our season sponsors who are Cardiff Metropolitan University and Hodges and their support is greatly appreciated, particularly through these challenging times. So the format this evening will follow that of our previous online events. Uh, I'll introduce the Secretary of State and after his address, we will undertake a question and answer session. Uh, as per the joining instructions, please would you send your questions as concisely as possible, please, directly to me by clicking into the chat box at the bottom of your screens, and then I will ask as many questions as I can in the time we have available. In fact, I know that Simon is planning to keep his address relatively brief so that he can take as many questions as possible. So please start sending in uh, the questions to me as soon as you can to ensure that they get asked. Um, you have the option of remaining in mixed participant viewing mode, or you can select the option at the top right of your screens just to have the speaker view. Uh, you can also uh, leave your video on or off. So we're expecting to conclude at around 6.45. So on to the introduction of our speaker. The Right Honourable Simon Hart MP was appointed Secretary of State for Wales uh, almost exactly a year ago today, I believe. Um, he was previously Parliamentary Secretary as Minister for Implementation at the Cabinet Office. He was elected Conservative MP for Carmarthen West and South Pembrokeshire in May 2010. And since being elected to Parliament, Simon has been a member of a number of select committees, including Welsh Affairs, Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, Political and Constitutional Reform, Digital, Culture, Media and Sport. He has also been a member or chair of several APPGs and was also formerly the Prime Minister's trade envoy to Panama, Costa Rica and the Dominican Republic. Simon worked as a chartered surveyor in Carmarthen and Haverford West and served with the Territorial Army for five years in the Royal Gloucestershire Hussars. Before being elected as an MP, he was Chief exec Executive of the Countryside Alliance. Simon lives in Clanmill near Narbeth, a beautiful part of the world in Pembrokeshire with his wife Abigail and their two children. So it is now my pleasure to invite the Secretary of State, the Right Honourable Simon Hart, to address us. Simon. Well, thank you very much indeed. And uh, uh, thank you, uh, actually a special thanks to everybody on this call, uh, because uh, I know every politician always says this, but, but maybe from time to time we actually mean it. Um, it's been a heck of a year. I do realise that uh, you know, everybody has endured uh, incredible challenges and hardship, uh, uh, personal and professional, and shown extraordinary resilience and patience throughout that time. So I, I, I probably don't get enough opportunity to, to say the, the nearest thing I can these days to a personal thanks. Uh, to everybody for uh, the sort of example and, and the leadership that you've shown over the year. It really is uh, appreciated, I know, by, by people across Wales and, and beyond. Um, I'm very conscious too that uh, it, it, the Business Club was around the last time the UK was hit by a pandemic at the end of World War One. So to some extent, you've you know you've been here before. Uh, you've lived this kind of scenario, albeit in a very you know different uh, time frame. But uh, you are sort of the, the, the living embodiment of how business can be resilient and can come through some extraordinary uh, challenges, rebuild, rebuild maybe a bit differently than 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 the, than the model which was there before. And all of that is, uh, I think, comes with some uh, opportunity. It's not all negative. Sometimes uh, out of adversity comes opportunity. And I think that, uh, you know, fingers crossed, and with, a, with a perhaps a better 2021 20, than 20, we should be able to see that recovery. So I thought what I'd do, uh, if Scott and, and, and others were, were happy, is just to touch a little bit on uh, the present situation, and, and in that, obviously, the two big subjects of the day, uh, COVID and uh, Brexit. Um, and before you ask, no, I won't be able to give you a timescale on whether a Brexit deal will be sealed uh, during this call or soon after. Uh, I wish, uh, beyond wish, that I could. Uh, a little bit about um, Brexit readiness, uh, and then perhaps a bit about uh, the future too, and maybe what uh, next year and the year after may have in store. Although, as Scott said, you know, when I took up this office, um, I say 12 months ago this week, uh, the idea that we 
had could predict knew what was just lurking around the corner um, uh, is you know, extraordinary looking back. I remember thinking that, uh, you know, we just won an election. We'd got the first sort of thing which resembled a majority since I've been involved in politics. Uh, we had a what we thought was an exciting plan of investment and activity. And then suddenly at the end of February, mid-February time, uh, we people started talking to us about this this uh, virus in, in, in Wuhan and China, and was it going to get to the UK? And if it was, what the effect would be? And it wasn't really until quite well into uh, that period of, of March that we suddenly realised the full extent of the storm that was heading our way. Uh, and as we, we all have our own uh, views and our own way of recalling uh, what happened next. But just to deal, uh, as I mentioned, with the present, and I think there's, uh, there's quite a lot of gloomy news about uh, today. There's, uh, there's some really quite horrifying figures, particularly in Wales, uh, but other parts of the UK too. London being going into a tier three situation as of uh, tomorrow night, Wednesday morning. Um, some, uh, some very vigorous rising statistics in various other parts of the UK. But uh, there are some uh, marginally happier figures around hospitalizations and, and thank goodness, around uh, mortality too. Uh, that's as a result of a, a, a very rapidly learning and developing understanding of what the disease has in store and what the proper and most effective treatments are. And, of course, the emergence of uh, a vaccine or three vaccines or four vaccines to help us deal with this. And I think it's... We're at that stage, and I heard Chris Whitty and, and, and Patrick Vallance talking about this the other day, of being able to genuinely look to science to be uh, there to replace uh, uh, societal intervention. So we should be in this position where we'll happily be able to slowly phase out lockdowns, restrictions, all of those things which have blighted our lives over the last um, nine, ten months. They should be replaceable as we roll out the vaccination program, uh, as I say, with, um, with a sort of medicinal input. And I was particularly pleased the other two weeks ago today to go to Wrexham with the PM uh, to visit uh, Wockhart, the uh, pharmaceutical company based in Wrexham, who are uh, busy uh, preparing for, we hope, regulatory approval for the Oxford AstraZeneca drug. And it's great that that, that vaccine will be produced uh, in Wales, uh, we won't have to worry too much about borders or deliveries or anything like that. 300 million doses in year one. And uh, isn't it great that actually a, a company based in Wales um, is going to be not just leading the Welsh recovery, the UK recovery, but actually playing a significant part in the global recovery uh, from this particular uh, unwelcome uh, visitor. And uh, but as I say, you know, we've got to be cautious, too. And I know there's a real fear within Welsh government between uh, and UK government and elsewhere to not to overpromise, not to overcommit, to recognise that there will be some significant challenges along the way. One of the many things we've learned about COVID is it's full of surprises. Um, it's just when you think you've cracked it, it comes up with another means of you know, defeating its um, uh, attackers. Uh, so Christmas is going to be difficult. Uh, there are going to be some relaxations. The, the government official messages that just because there are some relaxations doesn't need doesn't mean that we need to necessarily exercise them. And it's still, if the American uh, re response to Thanksgiving Day tends to go by, um, close family contact, uh, people huddled in in in, uh, in homes, multi generational meetings are exactly what COVID loves the most. So uh, we're of course uh, fully conscious that everybody has had a pretty, pretty, pretty difficult year. Um, and the one thing they would, would, would provide some uh, uh, welcome relief would be uh, something resembling a normal Christmas. But I fear that we've just got a few weeks and a few months uh, to go before the vaccine is sufficiently out there amongst those most vulnerable groups uh, uh, before we can actually declare uh, victory. So, uh, it, 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 difficult statistics, difficult week, difficult months, uh, but definitely um, some prospects of proper recovery during the early part and the mid part of next year. 
And then, of course, this all comes with the, uh, the challenge of how do we support businesses in the economy during that? And there have been so many stories over the last few months, and you will, you will have probably read them all or heard them all on the telly uh, about uh, have we listened to the science? Has Boris Johnson ignored the scientists? Has he, uh, over, has he been overcautious? Has, has he gone far enough? All of these different um, expert opinions being offered by pretty well everybody, it seems. But I just, there was one anecdote I would just, just to share with you, because I think it shows what uh, some of the challenges of political decision making, which won't be anything unusual to, to, to those who make uh, business decisions like this every day. But um, when we talk about listening to the scientists, there are three sets of scientists in this particular uh, arena. One is the, the medical scientists, the epidemiologists, the Chris Whitties and Patrick Valences of this world, who give us brilliant, fantastic advice based on global evidence every day. Uh, and they do it with great certainty and skill and, and without panic. Then there's the behavioral scientists, which nobody ever seems to talk about. They're the people who appeared out of the cabinet office in week one and week two of this pandemic and said, um, what advised us about what we could expect by way of public compliance with the proposals that we were coming up with around lockdown and financial interventions. And I just remember very clearly one uh, piece of advice in saying that basically we could expect three months worth of, of public compliance. And so choose our three months carefully. And it was a major part of that early decision making was to just make sure that we try to go into lockdown, not too soon, that people will get bored and restless and come out of it too soon, and not too late, uh, that the disease would necessarily take uncontrollable, uh, take an uncontrollable grip of society. And whichever date we chose, I'm sure we will always be accused of having been too late by some and too early by others. And then, of course, there were the we won't call them scientists, really, but eco economists who were offering a third dilemma for Boris Johnson at the time, which is, look, if you do this, uh, these are going to be the economic consequences. And sometimes economic consequences can trigger hardship and uh, deprivation at a level which will kill far more people than COVID ever will. So there were those three things that we had to balance at the time, medicine, behavior, and economics. Uh, and I'd never, and I didn't then, and I don't now envy this PM or any other first minister or PM. I have to make those uh, judgment calls literally every single day. But we do hope, uh, and from what we've heard from businesses across Wales and beyond, that the interventions that Rishi Sunak has been able to come up with, often at breathtakingly fast speed compared with the Treasury's normal um, uh, sort of uh, rate of um, rate of uh, delivery, have been. I, we hope they've been helpful. We hope they've saved a lot of jobs. We hope they saved a lot of businesses. We, you know, it's hugely saddening to know that we won't have reached everybody in every corner of Britain. There will be gaps into which people have fallen. Um, but it is not without effort on Rishi's part that every single eventuality has attempted uh, to be um, to be covered. And again, you know, we used to uh, walk out in, in, in Wrexham as, a, as an example. Salsa Steel down the road from where most of you are in Cardiff was another example of an early intervention from the Treasury, um, 30 million pound intervention, which uh, we hope was able to uh, keep Salsa uh, sustainable. Uh, their business was was affected directly as a result of COVID and the Treasury view was that's precisely the sort of business we should be there to help. And six to 800 jobs dependent on Delta saved as a result of sensible due diligence and hard work at pace from uh, the Treasury. So that was one. The second thing, um, Brexit. And uh, Ah, uh, blimey. Well, um, you know, as if COVID wasn't enough, uh, Brexit um, uh, has, um, I think, probably run the course that a lot of people thought that it would run. And I often say to people who have ever conducted any negotiation of any sort in their lives, whether it's buying a flat to selling a business, most of them always go to the 11th and a half or the you know one minute to midnight they will go right to the very end the absolute limits of the time scale there will be moments of great despair when it looks like the whole thing has fallen apart terminally and moments when we suddenly think there might have been a terrific breakthrough uh, which uh, and the clouds suddenly lift and the sun comes out and we are all able to shake hands amicably and wonder what all the fuss was about and the Brexit negotiations seem to be 
a, a big and stark example of exactly that. Uh, and uh, this thing nearly came to a grinding halt on Sunday. Uh, as we know, the last week, the expectation was we couldn't reach agreement by Sunday. We probably never would. And that looked like being the deadline. Then uh, Boris Johnson and the uh, EU president got together. It looked like there was some further scope, possibly. So we have made it very clear we will keep going as long as they want to keep going, um, because we remain determined, uh, if at all possible, to do a deal. But it isn't a deal at any cost. And I think the, the most significant part of this is the argument around uh, level playing field. And at the moment, the EU position is that uh, we would be expected to mimic uh, legislation passed uh, in Brussels, uh, whether it was economic, social, medicinal, agricultural. Um, and if we didn't mimic that legislation, then we would uh, expect to uh, face financial penalties for so doing. Now, that imposition is not uh, required by the EU as far as its free trade arrangements are with any other nation on the planet. So that is a specific, specific UK requirement, which the UK Gov says completely under, uh, completely demolishes the whole purpose of the referendum in the first place. It is clearly um, to us, uh, an unacceptable demand because actually, basically, it it it, it reverses the, the decision that you know 55% of uh, the nation took back in 2016. So that is a significant, probably the most significant sort of sovereignty level playing field sticking point that there is. Uh, and as I say, if it wasn't for the fact that they were happy to come to a different arrangement with many other nations around the world, then perhaps there would be room to maneuver. So that has to shift that that. Or impasse has to be broken before we're able to sign off on what we all want, uh, which is a fair uh, uh, FTA for both sides of this debate. So um, whilst all of that's happening, we're trying to get the, the, the readiness, uh, as we call it, situation under our belts. Um, come what may, whether it's a deal or no deal, businesses have to do uh, quite a significant amount of preparation. Uh, any business, whether any interaction with Europe, whether that's supply chain, labor, export, import, market, whatever, um, need to make preparations by the end of the transition period. Uh, we are all of us, I expect some people on this call have been subjected to webinars and seminars and Zoom teams, you name it, meetings, Welsh Gov uh, effort, UK Gov effort, um, to make sure that wherever possible, everybody is as prepared as possible uh, for what may or may not come our way on the 1st of Jan. And of course, it won't all hit like a meteor on the 1st of Jan. This will be, a, if there is a no deal Brexit, there will be, it'll be a gradual um, uh, it'll be a gradual experience for a lot of us over uh, the coming months. But nonetheless, there is a phenomenal amount of work going on behind the scenes by some very good people to make sure that the impact is as um, comfortable as it can be uh, in the circumstances. Uh, and there are those who, you know, we, we, we all look back and wonder what we would have all done differently. But the fact is, in Wales, unlike Scotland, there was a, a, a majority in favour of making this bold change. And we've always remained absolutely determined that the most important thing that any government should do is honour um, referendum or election outcomes. And, and this is one such um, decision that we intend to see through. And then just to finish uh, on the future, uh, quite a lot of, uh, I hope, good stuff. Uh, you would have heard about the, the shared prosperity fund. That's the, uh, the, the money which we would have been uh, submitting to as part of our membership of the EU being spent in the UK. Uh, that's been announced in the spending review last week by Rishi Sunak to get a pilot form in 2021, uh, and then we'll roll out more substantially in the years after that. And as EU money tapers off, so UK Gov taxpayer slash taxpayers money will replace it. Uh, that will mean even in 2021, you know, tens of millions of pounds finding its way uh, into Wales for jobs and livelihood based uh, bids. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, UK Gov and Welsh Gov are as collaborative as possible during that process. We want to make sure, though, that local authorities, stakeholders, people on this call have a uh, much closer involvement with the decision making around shared prosperity than has been perhaps the case in the past. Uh, you will have heard the PM 
endlessly talk about uh, leveling up and strengthening the union. Uh, by the way, that's not a competition between uh, UK government, Welsh government, or competition between Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales and England. It is a partnership. Uh, and we think that uh, the uh, economic benefits of being part of the union are very clear and very demonstrable, but that doesn't compromise individuality and all of the things that make the individual uh, nations the very special places uh, that they are. Where we've got growth deals uh, popping up, being signed uh, uh, hopefully in all corners of Wales as, as we speak, or certainly in the coming months. We have some exciting infrastructure projects. You will have heard me banging on about the M4 relief road. Uh, maybe one day um, we will um, actually get to a stage where we can do something about that. A55 rail improvements, digital, which will obviously be the centre of all of that. Trade deals that we're doing or have done with uh, Japan, Canada, Singapore, um, deep in negotiation with the United States under a new administration. And uh, of course, the will they won't they situation with uh, our closest trading partner in the form of the EU and also uh, you might have uh, uh, heard in the in the margins the PM's recent speech around the 10 point plan that's our target to meet uh, the net zero uh, 2030 uh, ambitions which have been mentioned so many times which to some people have been interpreted as a as yet another sort of layer of bureaucracy which is going to be imposed on a hard-hit economy actually we think quite the opposite we think there's a quarter of a million jobs going begging as part of this revolution we think there will be some really interesting projects in wales around uh, uh, nuclear around tidal wave all of the uh, uh, natural resources that uh, offshore wind would be another one so we actually think there's a really big job creation uh, opportunity for Wales around the uh, 10 point plan. And if anything, you know, I mentioned lessons from COVID. Well, one of the big ones is that actually we need to accelerate all of this. So rather than go back into a sort of uh, defensive crouch and and sort of a decade of austerity, actually really the opposite is, is the case. We really do believe that we now need to sort of turbocharge all of the sort of elements of the economy that we can and actually do it faster than we were even planning a year ago this week when we came out of the election, because we think that is the better way of being able to put COVID behind us and to be able to exploit uh, the opportunities as well as deal with some of the difficulties uh, that Brexit uh, may present. So I hope that's a, a useful, quick gallop, probably not as quick as Scott wanted me to be, apologies for that, quick gallop through the um, uh, what's happening and what we would like to happen. And But very happy to take questions and hopefully, as I say, one day when we're allowed, do all of this in person. Uh, but Scott, back to you and very happy to say to deal with questions in the time we've got. Simon, thank, and thank you very much for that. Um, we've certainly got some uh, meet, uh, sort of pretty significant topics that you've um, covered from uh, how we deal with COVID and move through it and out of it. Um, the whole uh, Brexit piece and, and obviously some uh, economic restructuring moving forward and turbocharging the economy. So I'm sure there will be plenty of questions. I'm starting to see some come through. So as a reminder, if you can send them to me, that would be, um, that would be helpful. Um, but I'll start with the first one that came uh, around to everyone, which was just a question really, which was around you know, concerns over social distancing, um, whether there's been any discussion about using face coverings outside as well as inside as other countries have done. Um, there hasn't been much talk in any of the meetings I've been in, but that doesn't mean that it hasn't been talked about. And we, want, we are constantly trying to review, uh, as you will have seen, um, uh, reducing the 14 day quarantine period to 10, uh, looking at all of the evidence about you know, whether wearing mask works and social distancing. I think that was going quite well until about three weeks ago when it looked like um, the numbers it started that you know that the, the recovery had started to, to stall a bit and that numbers in certain parts of the UK were going up. One of the things, just just worth saying this, I think, that there may be very good evidence for further relaxation in that regard. And it may be that uh, those measures have very little effect on the spread of COVID. But as everybody in this call would know, we've been widely criticized during this um, uh, pandemic for confusing messaging, which which I would obviously you know dispute, but that's for what I would do. But I, I do think that when we make an answer, they have to make sense. 
they have to they have to uh, sort of they have to recognize where the disease is and where it's going and i think sometimes introducing relaxation me 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 measures when the numbers are going the wrong way is a confusing message just as the opposite is the case so even as i say the, the evidence may say one thing but common sense and and public concerns says another and it's a difficult balancing act sure. um Rosie Moratti Simmons is just asking for those of us that are, have been shielding since March, uh, sort of just to get a sense of uh, people that, when people in those sorts of situations are likely to start getting vaccinated. Well, I was uh, in the um, Cumbran Vaccination Centre on Thursday of last week, and they were rattling through the uh, their first batch of uh, customers. I, I don't know if we call them customers, uh, but uh, which is mainly care home. Workers and frontline uh, and frontline NHS workers who have daily contact with uh, vulnerable groups. That's then um, so they're getting through those really well. Fantastic, you know, inspirational, well organised setup. Uh, and the that they're doing the Pfizer vaccine, so that will require a second jab in 21 to 28 days. Uh, and um, that's going on across Wales in every health board area. And then that will move on to the I can't remember the exact categories, but I think it's over 80s. And then over 70s and so on and so forth down through the 11 um, uh, classifications you know ending up with the, those at the least risk now of course um, the Pfizer vaccine has some logistical issues being, being stored at minus 70 being the most obvious one of course the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine when and if it is approved uh, can can be stored at fridge temperature and is a much more logistically manageable prospect. And so, but, and, and the fingers crossed, I don't know any more than anybody else in this, but we're hoping that might get regulatory approval almost any day now. And as they uh, walk out in Wrexham are poised over the green button to get that going in big volume. So I think that, I mean, certainly my mother who's 84 is expecting to be um, jabbed, you know, in the next two to three weeks. Uh, so uh, in her health board area. So uh, um, that's the sort of time, time scale. I, I think by March, April, we will see all of the, I hope, I hope, and this is a catch. So, you know, as I say, these things can go wrong, um, uh, you know, in the first quarter to half of 2021. Okay, thanks, Simon. Um, Chen Yutak, now you mentioned the M4 relief road, a question from uh, a Gordon Brown is why is there not a move towards uh, green uh, or green climate tidal lagoon type solutions rather than a relief road? Well, I think this, it, it's, it's not an either or. I think it, 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 it should be uh, all of the above. And Terry Burns's report, which he submitted to Welsh Government last week, which deliberately didn't include the M4 relief road, by the way, did make the point that actually transport improvements only work if you look at uh, footpaths, cycle paths, um, roads, rail, air, you can look at everything. It's got to be holistic. And I absolutely agree with that. Uh, and I think that, uh, so just improving the M4 doesn't resolve the problem. I absolutely, I, I, I subscribe to that. However, if we are serious, we, we, we've been talking a lot in the uh, UK and Welsh government about getting more tourists into Wales, more visitors, uh, 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 you know, staycations. That, that we, we are encouraging the rest of the UK to get on the road and come and visit Wales, either whether it's part of business or part of holiday. Uh, we can't do that and expect the existing infrastructure to simply uh, uh, cope as if nothing had happened. So we, we can't have it both ways. We can't, on the one hand, take cars off the road. At the same time, it's actually, I encourage people to make more use of the opportunities that are present uh, that are available in Wales. Um, clearly, you know, we want to, uh, to for public transport to be able to take a greater you know, element of uh, uh, traffic than it currently does. That's, a, as everybody on the call knows, probably a 10, 20, 30 year uh, project. And we've got to make sure that the infrastructure around electric vehicles and all that sort of keeps up with the um, uh, with those ambitions. So I do think it's 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 a bit of everything, uh, but you know the M4 is a it's a UK national asset. You could even describe it as a you know Republic of Ireland national asset too. It joins you know London with the Republic. It's not just a it's not just a Cardiff Newport asset. And I do think we have to look at it. In, as far as a sort of its strategic place in the whole of the you know UK economy. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Laura McAllister is asking: 
With a no deal Brexit potentially looming, could the Secretary of State outline the UK government's plans to avoid making the UK internal market the site for a constitutional crisis between the four nations? Well, I, that's a big question, Laura. Um, I, 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 it was interesting, I thought, in Welsh government's um, uh, or Senate's uh, debate last week on, on, on this, that there was an awful lot of reference to uh, power and the constitution and uh, devolution and not a lot of reference to jobs and livelihoods, investment and opportunity. And I found that quite telling, I, I must confess, being drifting into a slightly political speech here, because for me, uh, UK internal markets, every business I've spoken to pretty well in Wales has told me that they can't see anything remotely suspicious about uh, UK internal markets. They expect they've, they've operated hitherto uh, with an even level playing field between the four nations of the UK. And the fact that now we're leaving the EU, we're going to enshrine that in UK law seems to them to be an absolutely logical step. The fact that within the UK Internal Markets Bill, there will be a provision whereby UK government can spend money in Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland, you would think would be a good news story. Uh, at the moment, uh, it's th th that privilege is held by uh, it held in Brussels, where we have limited influence, democratic influence. Um, it'll now be a decision taken uh, by UK government with 40 MPs representing seats in Wales, having a direct input and a direct ability to hold UK government to account. But all I want to see at this is more money being spent on jobs and livelihood initiatives in Wales. And I want to see more of the... Um, uh, as I say, more localised decision making in that process. And I think that's what's touched a bit of a nerve is, and I'm going to be very controversial here, I detect occasionally that for some of our colleagues, devolution means basically Cardiff. Uh, devolution doesn't mean Cardiff. It doesn't mean Welsh Government. It doesn't mean the Senate. Devolution means uh, 22 local authorities and 22 sets of local authority councillors and charities and businesses across Wales, all feeling that they have and actually having a greater say in decision making than they've had hitherto. To me, that's what devolution is. So if making sure that, that everybody has a bite of the devolution cake, if that's considered to be a constitutional crisis, well, you know, so be it. I personally think it's the right thing to do. I'm not, I, I, I realize that will in some way, you know, uh, sort of restrict the power if you like, of UK government, well, that's fine. That's what. That's why. That's why devolution is is a good thing. Sort of, sort of following on from that. And Bynum's asking: under EU um, regional funds, there was a formula based on on the need as to where Wales benefited to a great extent than the more prosperous regions. So, who's determining the formula for the shared prosperity fund? Uh, that, uh, that will be, yeah, yeah, uh, no, absolutely. And I, I think that will be uh, the sort of the uh, heads of terms and the preparation for that is what's about to be announced in the new year. Um, but you can be sure that the stakeholders in that process are going to be a lot more closely aligned with Wales than they have been before. Because in the past, that has been a, 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 a Brussels-led initiative and I by the way you know I voted remain back in 2016 so you know I, I've I've made a, a you know a bit of a journey in this as far as this is concerned but the point is that that accountability is going to be much closer to home and the idea that you know for example Welsh government has sort of autonomy in this is absolute nonsense they never have um, and and I just see a situation now where if we're grown up about this, UK Gov and Welsh Gov can be much more collaborative before. We have many shared, I have a very good relationship with people like Ken Skates and, and co. We have many shared, and which shouldn't be beyond the wit of man for us to be able to, you know, just put aside for a little bit our sort of, you know, the political fun and games that we normally, you know, have to witness and, and do this as a collaborative um, exercise. I'm very happy to do that, but it does need to be more uh, accountable to more people, more sort of, if you like, elected individuals in Wales than it has been hitherto. So there is nothing to, you know, there literally is nothing to fear from this. Okay, Melanie Hamer is asking, um, from an economic perspective, do you think it was right that the last set of Welsh restrictions uh, that were put in place were an all Wales uh, situation 
rather than uh, rather than sort of looking at the COVID rates um, in, in you know in in. Well, I I did I wrote to Mark Drakeford at the time, and I did try to tactfully suggest that maybe uh, there was a sort of tiering system that could be applied in Wales to account for the fact that uh, there were significant regional differences and that, you know, punishing in a way one uh, part of Wales because of a particularly severe outbreak in another was uh, potentially problematic. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm aware, uh, but what at that time at any rate took a slightly different view. I, I'm not sure this week they might not actually be making a more sort of regionally nuanced approach to it. But I do, you know, the one thing I think we sometimes miss in this is that um, uh, trying to catch up with COVID once it's taken hold is bloody difficult. Uh, you have to get ahead of it. And so in some ways, um, restrictions and interventions uh, are based on trends rather than on numbers. So even an area with very low numbers, which are going the wrong way, it is, it is a justified intervention. We've got to get in front of it, although we have to get in front of COVID. Uh, whereas a number, a place with high numbers but declining, uh, might you know you could argue requires a slightly different uh, approach. Um, and so, uh, just as I say, I mean, in, for, for months in 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 Pembroke, where I live, uh, there were ter very very low numbers, and people were getting exasperated that their you know, particularly hospitality businesses were being adversely uh, impacted by decisions taken because there was a you know concentration in Merthyr, uh, for example, and people that was difficult to explain to people. But now, of course, with our numbers climbing, uh, everybody sort of say, well, why do we why do we do something sooner? Uh, it's, it's whether it's Nicola Sturgeon, Mark Drake for Boris Johnson, or the power sharing arrangement in Northern Ireland, these are really, really challenging decisions. Okay, um, a, a W Meredith has uh, asked the COVID Brexit and security concerns around the deployment of 5G infrastructure has brought into focus the importance of a strong UK manufacturing supply chain. Um, will the Share Prosperity Fund focus on strengthening the Welsh manufacturing and the high tech industry and innovation? Well, I think that's a really uh, that's a really good point, actually, because early in the uh, in the pandemic, we suddenly discovered that our manufacturing base for PPE, for example, was quite uh, limited compared with, say, Germany. Uh, that's just a historic structural uh, observation, and normally. That wouldn't necessarily pose a problem because if, if we were in desperate need for additional resources, we could go to one of the manufacturing bases, be it Germany or Switzerland, wherever they or China, and acquire the necessary material. However, of course, the, as it was, the pandemic was global by definition. Um, everybody was hoarding their own supplies, and it was very, very difficult to get our hands on the stuff that we needed when we needed. And I just re recall an early. Um, uh, meeting with the UKG saying that one of the things we would like to do is make sure that our manufacturing base around those essential um, goods uh, is transformed in time and if we ever get another of these uh, horrible uh, years. And, and I think the idea of using Shared Prosperity Fund or indeed other investment opportunities in the years going forward to encourage that kind of issue is a, is a really good idea. And exactly my earlier point about wanting to involve as many people as we can in the decision making process around SPF because we'll come up with some, you know, UK and Welsh Gov does not have a monopoly of wisdom and the good answers uh, when it comes to uh, uh, spending priorities. So that, that's a helpful intervention. Okay, I appreciate we're sort of running short of your time. Um, right. now, lots more questions. Uh, one from Ian Price. There was an announcement regarding Sizewell C nuclear plant today. Um, and what do we need to do in Wales to get the uh, Wilfer B off the ground again? Um, thanks, Ian, very much for that. Um, the, I haven't read the exact wording of the announcement, but it does refer, I'm pretty certain, to uh, at least one uh, nuclear plant in the UK as our ambition. There's a, there's a, there's a hint in that wording. Um, Sizewell was always quite well ahead of where uh, Wilbur was in the long, 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 long process of, uh, uh, of um, planning these kind of uh, enormous investments. And of course, the departure of Hitachi from the Wilbur arrangements, clearly it, it sort of set things um, uh, back, although the site remains um, one of the best in the world 
for an investment of that nature. So uh, there are discussions going on with other global players in the nuclear industry as we speak, um, early-ish stages. So, uh, uh, but all of those uh, early obstacles which people need to overcome in order to try and get these things off the ground, particularly around local buy-in, is obviously already sort of baked in as far as uh, uh, Wilbur is concerned. So that sets it in an, in, an, in an advantageous position. But the other thing is around uh, SMR, small modular reactors, um, is there's still a lot of interest in Transponit around the potential there. That technology, I'm told, I'm not an expert, is some years yet away from deployment capability. Uh, but we're very much focused on the fact that we think there is a sort of nuclear opportunity in Wales either with SMRs or uh, at, uh, at Wilfer. Um, but it's not, it's, you know, we're talking probably years rather than months before we make significant progress on that. Okay, just before we can't read the uh, notes, I think Ian's saying that he understand that Westinghouse and Fetchnell, is it? Uh, maybe current, currently interested. That's a comment, um, comment rather than a question, I think. Well, <laughs> I, I, um, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm gonna, Call, call the line because I know you've got to get away, Simon, but Linda Quinn just asked a quite a topical question around using hospitality as a sector that's obviously been hit really hard, made huge efforts to try to be COVID compliant, um, and you know, obviously a number of areas have received government uh, help. Uh, and the question really is how, how would you make sure the taxpayers' money in terms of support you know, goes to those businesses that are really making an effort to, to do what's, what's right in, in, in the COVID environment? Well, I uh, it, obviously we uh, hospitality is one of those areas which is uh, maybe taken the arguably the hardest hit. I suspect during the uh, and particularly because uh, COVID arrived, it's just the early stages of what should have been the best time for for making money. So it's sort of knocked out you know eighteen months or two years worth of income in, income generating capability and and uh, so although the treasury's obviously done what it can in the period that covid has been in, in place it hasn't necessarily but obviously been able to compensate for the lean periods either side of that um that said the um vat reduction to five percent from twenty percent uh, is uh, has been generally welcomed in the industry that would obviously there will now be a very lively campaign to try and make that as permanent uh, as possible and i do accept that you know there are some elements of hospitality who have made particular effort and find it amusing that actually have, have, you know some of the some of the strange rules around um, uh, you know being able to eat but not drink or drink but not eat or you know what constitutes a square meal all these other things are uh, you know can be mystifying and there is uh, there are people within the cabinet office across the road from here who who have a very you know slick answer to all of those groups. All I would say is that they, they haven't just been plucked out of a hat as uh, they, they have been considered, they have been thought about, they have been, you know, whether it's a, uh, a, a you know, kicking out time of 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, the, the decision may not necessarily appeal to anybody, there may be no logic to it, but a lot of thought has gone into uh, what works and what doesn't work. Um, all I can say is that the, the, the intention is always, uh, throughout the whole thing and will continue to be to get out of restrictions just as soon as uh, it is evidentially safe to do so. It's a really, uh, I don't want to keep making it sound like it's uh, sort of hand wringing, but it is very, very difficult to make these calls in a way that is works for everybody. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've been, we've had so many occasions where you know, we've looked back and thought, well, maybe we could have done that a bit differently. Um, that we, we definitely err on the side of caution, um, uh, as I think most people in, in the centre ground of science would expect us to. Well, Secretary of State, um, thank you very much. Uh, as I said, unfortunately, I, I, I've got more questions, but uh, you know, time. <laughs> We agree to time. We do it again. We can do it again sometime. Yeah. Exactly. But um, but on behalf of the club, firstly, thank you very much for addressing the club in the way that you have, but also for giving you know some very sort of open and candid uh, answers to the questions that uh, were able to be asked. Um, you know, I've you know got a clear sense of you know kind of the the balance that you've got uh, in managing this very very difficult COVID situation. Um, and as you say, hopefully opportunity will come out of. Uh, of uh, adversity, and you've, you've obviously talked about you know the, the potential for the vaccine, but also you know put forward the 
you know, the caution that's required and the difficulty of managing, um, you know, kind of medicine versus economics versus um, behavioural uh, challenges as well. So that was really helpful. Clearly Brexit, uh, some very difficult negotiations that you outlined in that whole question of sovereignty uh, and, uh, and obviously us being ready for it. Um, and um, it, looking into the future, making sure that we do turbocharge the economy, particularly in light of COVID and um, maybe the opportunities that Brexit uh, provide for us. So uh, I'd say on behalf of the club, thank you very much for joining us this evening and for your time. And I'm just going to make a, a, a few more uh, points before we, uh, we, we close. Um, the, um, the next uh, item I just want to, to cover, um, and it's not something that you know, the club would regularly agree to do, but it seemed highly relevant and timely to do so. Um, and with Brexit clearly uh, potentially so near to us, the new regime does pose various challenges to businesses in respect of moving goods, services, people and travel. Um, and Chamber Wales just asked us to mention the fact that they have launched a new brand and website uh, and its staff are skilled, qualified and underwritten to provide advice and services to uh, help businesses at this time. Uh, the Chamber, under its new focus, is dedicated to helping all businesses in Wales to overcome uh, the challenges of moving goods and services and to developing new markets for companies. Uh, and part of a network of over 100 uh, offices, the Chamber is strongly positioned to help both existing and new exporters uh, and importers. So if you're interested in learning a bit more about that, um, their website is uh, chamberwales.com. So go and have a look at that if you like. Uh, and I must uh, also say, I know with Ian Price on the call, uh, that uh, clearly the CBI uh, uh, has a wide membership as well. And I'm sure is uh, supporting its members widely in this regard too. So moving on from that, I just want to make reference to some sad news that the club was informed of recently, uh, that two long-standing supporters and members of the club uh, have recently passed away. Firstly, Martin Warren had been a long-standing attendee at club events and in recent years in his capacity as director of ICEAW Wales, who have been regular event sponsors. Uh, and Martin was extremely well known uh, in the political and local business communities. And then secondly, H, as he was known, Hugh Thomas, uh, was also extremely well known in the business, uh, Welsh business community and a long-standing supporter and attendee of this club, uh, not only in his capacity as a past board member and treasurer, uh, but more recently as an honorary uh, vice president. Our deepest condolences go to uh, Martin and Hugh's families uh, and friends, uh, and they will both be sorely missed by the club uh, and its members. So I hope that you have all enjoyed this virtual meeting and the thoughts and comments of the Secretary of State in particular. Uh, our next event will be held again online uh, on the 18th of January, when we will hear from Neil Johnson OBE, who is Chairman of uh, Kinetic, a British multinational defence technology company headquartered in Farnborough. Uh, Neil was born and educated in Cardiff uh, and after Sandhurst and a successful career in the army, uh, reaching the rank of Colonel, he worked for the Ministry of Defence. He then moved into the private sector, holding a number of senior roles, including being a board member of Land Rover and uh, Chief Executive of the RAC. So I'm sure that will be an interesting event. Uh, further details on this and other future events are on the club's website. Thank you again to our season sponsors, Cardiff Metropolitan University and Hodges. Um, and we are keen to speak to any other organisations who might be interested in sponsoring one of these. Uh, in our current uh, series of virtual events. So if you are interested in receiving details, please do contact either Paul Fulham uh, or Liz Brooks. Um, also a request from myself to our individual members to please renew your membership if this has fallen due. Uh, we appreciate that there are, uh, that we are kind of unable to gather in person, which so many of you value, but it is really important that we still receive some income to sustain the club during these challenging times uh, and your ongoing support would be much appreciated. So to conclude, uh, thank you all again for joining us tonight. Uh, we hope that you and your families continue to be safe and well uh, and are able to enjoy the festive season as much as will be possible uh, this year. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you again in the new year on the 18th of January. So thank you and good evening.